And welcome, Bent Riders from around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. I'm coming from you. I'm coming to you today, live from the Bike Studios in Columbus, Ohio, where we broadcast monthly, uh, usually the first Sunday of the month. Uh, this month we've gone to the second due to the holiday. Uh, our webcast is uh, is archived on YouTube. All our past shows are there. You can also find them on the laidbackbikereport.com website, where we have them all archived. So you can go back and see everything back to last February, which is when we started, and lots of interesting interviews uh, from that period of time. Um, you can watch the show uh, live on uh, Google+. Uh, you can watch it live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or on that uh, website, laidbackbikereport.com. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment during our show, we have a couple of guests, and I'm sure you'll have some questions for them. Um, feel free to do though do that. You can do it on uh, Google Plus by uh, uh, going on the event page, which you should be watching from on uh, Google Plus, and making a comment. Or you can go directly to YouTube if uh, you can get right to the uh, player in YouTube. You can make a comment under the box uh, where you're watching the video, and uh, we will see those comments and bring them up on the screen. And uh, we will uh, ask our guests the questions or, or, the, or show them the comments that, uh, that you make. So we encourage you to do that. That makes the show um, a lot more interesting. So, um, And if you're on Twitter, by the way, uh, we don't usually get a lot of response from Twitter. But if you are, uh, use the hashtag LaidBackBikeReport, and uh, we'll get to see that there. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about the webcast today. Uh, it's broken down into four sections. We will have uh, first our uh, interview. And in this case, we have two interviews. We have a couple of guests with us today. Uh, we usually then have the recumbent news of the month uh, from Travis. But uh, Travis has got a charity gig today and is uh, not able to be with us. So we'll probably catch up with the news uh, on the next report. Uh, we'll have an open question and answer period from the audience. If you have any uh, anything anything to add or questions at the end of the interviews, please feel free to uh, ask those questions, make those comments then, and uh, then we'll deal with with some uh, Google Plus recumbent uh, bike rider community business. We have a little contest going. Uh, we'll talk about the winners of that contest at the end of the show. So uh, I'd like to at this point introduce our panelists uh, that are with us today. Uh, first, we have Carl Kidd returning. Uh, Carl is the moderator of the Bent Society of Southern Florida Community on Google+. Carl is retired and leads a twice-weekly ride along the scenic Atlantic coast on his Bichetta Corsa. Carl helps produce this webcast with me and handles our live comments. Welcome, Carl. Hi, Gary. Glad to be here. Great to have you. And uh, our other panel member, is Lars Kamm. Lars uh, comes to us from Salzgitter, Germany. He rides an HP Velotechnic Street Machine GTE and a Strata Velomobile named Intrepid. It, Lars blogs at www.streetmachinist.de and helps produce and direct this webcast as well. So it's good to see you, Lars. Hi there, Gary. Good to be here. Uh, our, um, our fourth panelist, Danny Voorhees, is uh, is on assignment in uh, in Wisconsin actually, uh, so uh, he'll be back with us uh, uh, next month, and uh, we look forward to seeing him. So, without further ado, let's uh, let's delve into our interviews. Our first guest uh, this month is uh, a, a, a uh, Julie Keating, who is with Amling Cycle Shop, uh, and also the Cube or Chicagoland Unconventional Bicycle Expo which is to be held on October 2nd through 4th, uh, 2015. So first weekend in October. So I'd like to uh, welcome Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on. Uh, a lot of people talking about Cube and having uh, have a lot of questions about it. So I'm hoping you'll be able to take this opportunity to clear some things up and uh, fill us in. So. Uh, let's go. Let's uh, first of all maybe talk about uh, what your role uh, in with Cube is. How? What is your role? Uh, actually, I'm the manager of the event, um, putting all of the little bits and pieces together, getting the exhibitors uh, online, uh, and putting something out there to allow attendees to sign up to come. 
um, putting things together, finishing touches with the convention center and etc. Okay. So can you tell us where the idea for Cube originated? This is the first uh, Cube, right? So tell us where this idea came from. Well, you know, there's this little show in, in Germany uh, called Spetsy. And as we were talking to different manufacturers and whatnot, we really kind of decided Chicago needed to have a Spetsy. Uh, so we're, we're going to give it our best shot. And we know we're not going to be as big as Spetsy to begin with. Uh, but, you know, we hope in a few years, uh, maybe we'll give them a run for their money. Who knows? I gotcha. So, uh, you say you pattern it after Spetsy. Now, how do you how do you anticipate this show will be like Spetsy, and how do you think it will be different? Well, um, I it will be a lot like Spetsy in that we're going to include all unconventional bikes, uh, so everything from, you know, unicycles to quadricycles, recumbents, trikes, cargo bikes, uh, and anything that's not in the conventional realm. Um, Spetsy has a great following. Uh, they have a huge area to do things in. Uh, I think here in the Midwest we'd be a little challenged to be able to pull something like that off. And uh, we just really don't have great weather in Chicago in uh, the middle of the winter either. So we're, we're challenged by that as well. Of course. All right. Well, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, lining up the exhibitors. Um, tell us a little bit about who you have lined up so far. What do you expect to, <clears throat> to see in terms of exhibitors this year? I, you know, I think we're going to have a very good showing of all of the uh, big recumbent players, big trike players and that. Uh, of course, we have Amlane Cycle, who's going to bring out uh, a myriad of different uh, cycles to the show. Uh, Bacata, Cat Trike, uh, HP Velotechnique, Terra Trike. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be bringing a, a ton of things with them to the show. Um, we have uh, Terra Trike will be there, Ice will be there, and then. Um, Bike Rack will also be there, so they'll have Hase there and Green Speed and uh, some of those uh, that aren't able to make the show will be represented by uh, Bike Rack. And then we also have things like uh, Bandbox, which is kind of a unique helmet covering to pretty up your helmet, make it not look like a helmet. Uh, bent up, vented Cycling for clothing, uh, Easy Load Ramp System. Um, Cozy Cyclery will be there with folding bikes and electric bikes, uh, Sports Crafter, uh, and then uh, some other little or type of different things. Uh, Tandy Leather Company, who specializes in little trinkets and that for uh, bicyclists as uh, tchotchke type things. Okay, so you have an entire tchotchke section, no doubt. So that's great. Um, all right, so. You also will have uh, seminars, I believe, uh, set up at, at the uh, show. Can you tell us a little bit how, about who will be uh, talking at the seminars, what the uh, subjects might be? Um, sure. Uh, His Wheels International is also going to be one of our exhibitors. They are going to be doing some seminars on uh, ergonomics, uh, both in recumbent and in hand cycling. Okay. Um, we have uh, talked with some people to do some seminars on training and how to appropriately train, uh, not only getting ready for the season, but how to keep um, stamina and whatnot uh, throughout the winter months, uh, what you should or should not be doing there. Uh, and then things like, you know, okay, I'm thinking about buying a recumbent. What are the things that I should be doing now, uh, later? Um, you know, trying to help people through that decision process as well. Okay. Now, uh, when you see Spetsy uh, on shows of this nature, there's usually a test track set up for, for testing the various sorts of bikes that are on exhibit. Is that going to be the case uh, at Cube? Absolutely, Gary. One of the reasons why we chose Tinley Park, uh, not only do they have a great location for people to be able to get to, but they had one of the largest uh, test riding areas that were going to be available to us. 
Uh, if you go and you Google uh, Google Earth Tinley Park Convention Center, uh, you'll see that their parking lot is extremely large, and they're going to devote the entire northern side of the convention center for test riding. So uh, we feel as though we're going to have a, an extremely large area for people to be able to get out and test ride. All right. So for uh, the recumbent riders and maybe potential recumbent riders uh, or unconventional bike riders that are out there that are watching you right now and maybe on the fence about uh, coming to Cube in Chicago the first weekend in October, tell me what you're going to tell them to make them come and see you in, at Cube. Well, I think it's a show not to be missed. I think if you're looking for a recumbent or you just want to see what's out there, uh, meet some of the manufacturers, people that are in the business, get some good ideas about recumbents, uh, be able to test write everything that's there. Uh, this is a one-stop shop to be able to do that. Okay, that sounds like a good pitch there. Uh, guys, anybody on the panel have any questions for Julie? About the cube? Okay. I guess that's it then. So, Julie, anything to add then uh, as a final uh, as a final statement? No, we hope we see everybody there. And, Gary, I just want to say thank you again for having me today. I appreciate it. I sure appreciate you coming on, Julie. And please uh, stick around if you like. Uh, for our next guest, you might want to have a couple questions for him or listen in. You're welcome to stick around. If you got to go, that's fine too, though. But we appreciate you being on, Julie, and we wish you uh, all the luck in the world with Q. Thank you. Great. Okay, uh, folks, let's move along to our uh, our next guest. Um, this gentleman uh, is probably someone that most recumbent uh, riders uh, know or have heard of. Uh, he and his wife are the owners of the Hostel Shop in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. The Hostel Shop is probably the largest uh, retailer in, uh, re recumbent retailer in America. Certainly, one of the most highly regarded uh, retail recumbent. Uh, dealers in America. Uh, they're renowned for their vast selection, their personal service, and they have a wonderful reputation in both their stores and in their uh, online business as well. Roth and the Hostel Shop are pillars in the Bend community, which means they've been around for a while. Uh, and, and that uh, that allows him to have, uh, to have experienced a lot in the Bend community over the years. We're very honored to have Ralph Garthus with us today. Hello, Ralph. Hey, Gary. Thanks for having me. It's great it's to be great. here, and thanks for all the kind words. <laughs> okay, well, now you have to live up to them, I suppose. So let's let's get started with this interview. I don't think you're going to have any trouble living up to them. So, all right, can you can you let's let's start at the beginning here. Can you briefly tell us uh, where you're from? Are you originally from Wisconsin? I am. I, I grew up in western Wisconsin, uh, Trump Trump County, by the way. And uh, <laughs> that, that Trump, from, uh, you say. I'm getting some music in the background. Okay, I think we could. I'm, okay, let's start over right. again. Sorry. So, so, yeah, you're from Wisconsin. So, yeah, Trumplow County is the um, Trumplow and Buffalo County are over on the western edge of the state, along the Mississippi River. And and by the way, for anybody that uh, is interested in doing a, a really interesting destination bike trip. Uh, Exploring Trumplow County and Buffalo County and, and La Crosse counties over along in the Mississippi River Bluffs is phenomenal. It's it's our one of our favorite places to ride. And there are a lot of uh, a lot of good bike uh, trails out that way too. I've ridden some of those. I think. Am I right? Is the well, uh, there, Sparta there, Elroy? That's not quite all the way there. to the Yeah, but the, well, the Sparta. You can actually start in Trumplow and ride all the way down through the Sparta Elroy Trail. Okay. But okay. the um, the beauty of that area is that, and, and Wisconsin in general, is that we've got all these extremely lightly traveled paved roads, and I'm sure you experienced them on our, our uh, at our at our recumbent rally. I sure did, and 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 have for many years. So yeah, and uh, and the western part of the state has got just huge river bluffs and hills and stuff. There are some some big climbs. You know, you might climb for uh, you know a mile and a half or two miles, but then you're up on top on these rollers for a long time, and and the scenery is just phenomenal. It's, it's a pretty area. Highly uh, recommend. How, it. how about your um, how about your schooling? Where did you go to school? I went to school in Northeast Iowa, Luther College, and uh, so. Um, and what was what was your area of study? 
Uh, mathematics. Mathematics, okay. Yeah, and, and in my former life, I was a high school math teacher before I was so. You were a high school math teacher, okay. Yeah. I, I was yeah. not aware of that, so that's interesting. Um, okay, so when did you start riding bicycles? We actually started, uh, well, I mean, I was riding when I was very young, you know, but uh, not not really going out and doing long rides, you know. So when I was teaching down in northeast Iowa, we got some uh, Jetan 10 speeds and, uh, and started riding. And uh, I remember our first ride, I mean, we were in our, our 20s at the time, and I remember our first ride, we went out and rode five miles, and we came back, and our legs just felt like rubber, you know, we were... <laughs> I thought that was a really long ride, but we very quickly started riding more and more, and uh, and we did actually eventually get involved with American Youth Hostel, which is kind of where the name Hostel Shop came from. Oh, okay. And uh, and so in the American Youth Hostel organization, they have various qualifying rides. You know, 25 miles in two hours, 50 and five, 75 and seven, 110 and 224, stuff like that. So we started doing a number of those rides and, and very quickly got uh, addicted to the sport. <laughs> so. Very nice. Let's, uh, let's segue from that sort of bike riding into, uh, in, into recumbent bike riding. Can you tell us about your experience uh, the first time you, you saw or encountered a, a bent and, 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 ro and rode one? Well, yeah, I uh, in my in my early 40s, I started to have uh, problems with my neck. Uh, from you know, I was I was doing triathlons and riding with a group of pretty hard, fast riders. And uh, but you know, you're down on the drops and you're looking up and you've got your neck craned at that kind of unnatural angle. And for me, that just wasn't working out. I was starting to have some pinched nerve problems in my uh, in my neck and pain running down my arm and stuff like that. And uh, so when we were at various bike shows, I, I started looking at some of the uh, recumbents that were out there. And actually, the first one I got was back in 1983. I had a, a Lightning, but not a, not a Tim Brummer Lightning. I, hmm. I think this was a, uh, an old long wheelbase Lightning. It had aircraft cables for steering, and, uh, and it had just a cheap ash tabula type crank set on it. It wasn't much of a bike. And... Uh, I rode it for about a year and, and got rid of it and, and was was glad I was able to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> but a few years later, I uh, we were down at another bike show and uh, the old cab to bike shows down in Chicago, and uh, I ran across a linear down there. So I got the linear, and uh, of course the uh, the employees that were down there with me uh, would always cross their eyes and groan every time I got another recumbent, you know. But anyway, I started riding that linear, and I was able to, uh, you know, after, after a while, after 40 or 50 miles, I felt really comfortable on it and everything, and I could, could handle it really well and everything, but I just couldn't keep up with my friends on it. And so that led me to uh, Tim Brummer and a Lightning P38, which I got and rode for a long time back then. And with that, I was able to keep up with my friends, you know, on their upright bikes. So I always say I got kind of dragged kicking and screaming into it, you know, and that was in the, uh, that was in the um, late 80s. Okay. And uh, once I, you know, when I was in my 40s, I was gradually giving up on these longer rides. Uh, I'd given up on, on century rides, on 100 milers. I'd given up on metric centuries. Uh, I was down to riding 25 miles hard and fast and getting off the bike in pain, you know. Yeah, just because yeah. of the physical difficulties that you're yeah, having. Because and you were, you, were still a ma you were still a high school math teacher at this time? Is that yeah. Uh, no, by then I was, was full-time in the store. We were, see, we okay. are a regular bike shop, too. Yeah. Oh, and that's how you started? Let's, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. So um, yeah. let's, let's, let's go back just a little bit here and, and talk about the beginnings of the hostel shop. You did mention about where the name came from. So do, you went from being a high school math teacher, deciding to go into business and open a bike shop. Is that the story? 
That's correct. Yeah, and, and I was actually still teaching at the time. I, I taught for five years while we started the store in Stevens Point. We started in 1974. Okay. And uh, so I kept teaching so that we had income you know, for right, a while right. until we got the store developed to the point where uh, where we felt that, that I could quit and just devote uh, mm -hmm. full-time attention to the store. Barb was actually running the store most of the time. And uh, so there's some kind of interesting, funny stories about that that maybe I shouldn't go into. <laughs> no, it <laughs> sounds to me like you absolutely should go into that. Wait, wait, wait. Involving our first child, which or our second child, rather, which she almost had in the store while she was there alone. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, yeah, but... But we, all right. Well, let's skip over that then. That's yeah, uh, all right. Hard. So you you yeah. started this bike shop. Uh, it be started to be a little bit more successful, but it was just a regular uh, upright bike shop. So Up, can upright you talk bike, to us? actually upright bike shop. And what what one of the things that really first got me into retail was actually cross country skiing. Okay. It really, you know, our 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 my very first uh, efforts in retail was uh, selling cross country skis, and okay. then and then. The following summer, and this was in another town, uh, we added some bikes, and so then it kind of grew from there. But then we didn't like that particular area. This was over in uh, Minnesota at the time, uh, west of Rochester, Minnesota. Okay. Uh, pretty uh, heavily farmed area, you know, not 97 percent tillable in this little county, okay. and uh, polluted streams and all that. And so I was used to Wisconsin with nice clean streams and a lot of trees and stuff and so we came to Stevens Point with the idea of uh, you know looking to start a shop here which we did. Um, and when was that? When was that Ron? That was in 74. Okay. 1974. Okay. Yep. All right so now this you were selling some sporting goods the 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 cross-country skis a few bikes and that kind of thing. Can you tell us about the transition into the recumbents and when you started, so you talked about when you started riding them and became more comfortable. When did you decide it was time to start selling recumbents? Tell us about that. Well, so shortly after I started riding it and got really comfortable with it and I was uh, I was kind of leading up to this and then I kind of lost my way. <laughs> but um, I was, um, as I said, I was I had gotten very uncomfortable doing long rides. Well, after I started riding a recumbent, in short order, I was doing 100 mile days with vastly more comfort than I ever had when I was 30 years old doing a 100 mile day on my upright bike, you know. And uh, and so I said, wow, I got to tell people about this, you know. So so that's how it started. And um, and I think the first year we sold. We were selling P38s at the time, and I think we sold, uh, you know, five or six, which for us at that time was a, a big deal. But that was in like 1989 or something. And uh, and then a short time later, uh, Grant Bauer and uh, Joel Smith came through town, and uh, with their visions, they were kind of taking a tour around through Wisconsin, showing people their bikes. And uh, so we put in the visions, and so then we had vision and and uh, lightning, and it, you know it grew from there. And then we shortly after that found out about rands, and so then we added them and so on. And we started our our recumbent rally. Uh, I'd have to go back and figure. I think this year was our 22nd, maybe. So you'd have to do the math, figure out how far back that goes, but. Uh, so somewhere in the mid '90s, we started our our recumbent rally, and we also started our catalog back then. Um, so this was mail order catalog, of course. This is before the online businesses were even out. Well, there. sort of, yeah. The first catalog wasn't much, <laughs> and uh, but the concept was to have something to give to people in the store, at least if nothing else. I see. And, uh, and then we gradually started developing a mailing list. I mean, in those days, guerrilla marketing was real easy for recumbents because nobody else anywhere around had them, you know. So we were, I, there was like a, a picture of me riding a vision uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Fox River Valley, this uh, 
the big newspaper over in the Fox River Valley has a Sunday supplement, which has this Sunday magazine, which is a you know pretty good sized piece. And I was the front cover in color on me on a vision, you know, writing that. And uh, we had uh, a guy, uh, a writer, and did a. Uh, a story on recumbents. I mean, everybody, all these newspaper people wanted to do stories on him because it was new and it was exciting and it was different. And uh, it was pretty interesting. He came up and uh, in his story, he said, I, I came up and they talked to me about the recumbents. And, and then they took me over to the alley of embarrassment, which was his, which was his term for the, the alley across the street from our store where we used to take people to do their test rides. And, he came up with this term, the alley of embarrassment, which I thought was pretty funny. So hopefully no outsiders would be around to, to, to see the humiliation of people starting to ride on uh, the, well, the first time. There were plenty of outsiders around. <laughs> it, <laughs> it was, was, right, uh, it was, it was right the place downtown. to be at lunchtime, probably. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing on his part. But we got him going and got him riding okay, and uh, he did well. So anyway... Through all of that, we uh, we were able to get the word out about our our first recumbent rallies. Mm-hmm. And, and we had a uh, we had some people. Well, first of all, Grant Bauer did a uh, great presentation on design and on designing recumbents and how how design has to be a compromise. You have to kind of pick and choose and get just the right uh, combination of things to work well for a large group of people. And and as if it had been planned to have a good counterexample, you know, of what not to do, a guy showed up with a rear wheel steering recumbent bike. Ooh. Yeah. Rear wheel steering because he drove the front wheel and he drove the front wheel because he didn't want a big long chain. And so one thing led to another. There are actually front-wheel drive recumbents today that you sure. can steer the front wheel, but back then he uh, didn't figure out how to do that. And uh, so he had designed this thing as a rear-wheel steering recumbent bicycle, if you can imagine. Out of He told me out of 200 that had tried to ride it, he was the only one who was ever successful in riding it. And I remember we were uh, we were riding near Amherst. Uh, these rallies were out in Amherst at the time. We were riding near Amherst, a group of about 20 of us. And we'd be riding down the road, and he would suddenly just careen completely across the road to the other side and back again in an effort to regain control. <laughs> because you can imagine you can imagine backing your car down the freeway, you know, right. 70 miles an hour right. or something, and you have a fairly good idea of what this thing was And I can like. also imagine how crazy that would be had your roads not been so uh, free from traffic as they oh, used to Oh, yeah. It would have been really dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And another guy showed up with a uh, with a uh, recumbent made out of, uh, out of uh, PVC pipe, six-inch PVC pipe, and uh, but with a DuPont Emron paint job on it. Now, are, are you familiar with DuPont Emron? It's like very expensive paint, yeah. you know. And so he had this plastic pipe with, <laughs> with a plastic lawn with the legs cut off, bolted onto it for a seat. And um, and then this, like, hundreds of dollars DuPont Emron paint job at the time. It was pretty pretty interesting. And the thing was real kind of floppy and, you know, bouncy when you wrote it. Uh, but we had so we and so there were all these people that were uh, experimenting at that time, and and there were some uh, there were some good ones, and there were some not so good ones. But it, it made it made very interesting for a very interesting uh, experience. Sure, sure, it sounds like it. All right, let's uh, let's get back to the hostel shop per se, and let's talk about. Um Let's talk about uh, the development then. So you've got the recumbent bikes into the hostel shop, and uh, you were in downtown uh, Stevens Point, and things started to grow pretty well for you, and then at some point uh, you decided you needed to make a move. Is that fair to say? Yeah, actually we made several moves. We were, uh, let's see, by the time we started, okay, by the time we started selling recumbent bikes, we actually were at the 929 Main Street location, which was the last downtown location that we were at before we moved out to where we are now. Um, 
So at the time, we were doing a lot of shipping. And uh, we had several problems in the downtown. Uh, one of them was that um, when people come to try recumbent bikes, you know, they, especially recumbent bikes, it takes a while, uh, more so than recumbent trikes, perhaps. And um, so people were parking downtown and getting parking tickets all the time because they were there for like half a day and there was this two hour limit or whatever in the downtown. So, so that was a problem, but we were also doing all this shipping and we had to have a, a space to create all these big boxes to ship trikes and bikes in and, uh, and we really were just running out of space. We were in a, uh, we were in a building that was, uh, that had about uh, 16,000 square feet if you counted an 8,000 square foot basement and an 8,000 square foot main floor. But it had sort of walls and stuff down it and it was all compartmentalized and uh, it was pretty difficult to work in and it was really difficult moving uh, tandems and so on up and down the stairs. and So we had an opportunity to uh, build this this new building that we're in right now, which is 13,000 square feet. Not not as much space, but much better designed, and, uh, and and it has worked out extremely well for us. Yeah, and for those of you who have not had a chance to visit the hostel shop in Stevens Point, the new one, it is a fantastic facility. You will be astounded if you've been to smaller uh, recumbent bike shops uh, around America, um, which everyone has their favorite. Uh, but if you go to the hostel shop, it's 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 more um, like uh, a, 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 an extravaganza of recumbents, and you will be astounded when you go. So, um, let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the future of the of the hostel shop. Then, so do you consider uh, the idea of expanding further, um, adding more different kinds of sporting goods, or adding more lines of recumbent bikes? We'll get, we'll get into the lines that you actually have developed yourself, uh, Rolf, but uh, is there any uh, idea of expansion at this point? No, no, there isn't. You know, I, you know I'm in my 70s now, so <laughs> there's a you limit to you, you how, much more I wanna, <laughs> how much more I want to do and get into. Um, but no, we don't have any, any, uh, any intention to expand, and uh, we have, you know, we're just kind of picking and choosing between the various brands right now. We... We did add Azu last year, and that's been working out very well for us. And uh, but there's there's just a lot of good choices out there. Let's talk briefly. Uh, I guess one of the major uh, changes in in the business uh, that I know that you've experienced. We've talked a little bit about it before. Is is this uh, is the trike phenomenon? So uh, I know that's made a major uh, difference to the way that you've done uh, business. Can you tell me a little bit about the uh, the development of the of the trike and your business? Yeah, it's uh, you know, uh, one of our one of our goals has always been to be personally involved with whatever it is we're selling. I mean, we, we started selling cross-country skis because we were cross-country skiers, and we started selling recumbent bikes because we rode recumbent bikes and so on. And uh, so the recumbent trikes started to get popular in, I'm going to say, the late 1900s, early 2000s. And uh, we suddenly found ourselves selling all these recumbent trikes, but neither Barb and I had ever spent any significant amount of time on them. And, uh, and we were... Quite frankly, we were kind of looking down our nose at them a little bit. <laughs> We'd have these conversations like, "Well, I suppose one of these days we should get on one of those and you know ride it home." We live about 17 miles from the store and we commute back and forth quite a bit. So I suppose we should get on one of those and ride it home and see what that's all about. And you know that kind of an attitude. And uh, and that went on for too long. Uh, I always say it's kind of an embarrassingly long amount of time. We love one. <laughs> uh, but then one day about, um, oh, maybe five, six years ago, we were down in Florida at the Cat Trike Rally. And we rode, uh, they set us up, Paulo set us up on these Cat Trikes that we rode for four days. And about halfway through the first morning, I looked at Barb and said, are you having fun? And she looked back and said, yeah, are you? And I said, yeah, a lot. <laughs> you know? So we were having a ball. And uh, we came back and we immediately got recumbent trikes and uh, started riding them. And 
you know, not long after we were uh, riding our trikes, uh, I was out riding one day on my trike, and uh, and I met a guy on his upright bike, friend of mine on his upright bike, who would have normally been on his road bike, but not that day. That day he was on his mountain bike, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, that's right. When I used to ride upright bikes, I had two bikes. I had a road bike and I had a mountain bike. I had two different ways to experience turning a crank. And that's kind of what's going on with me right now. I still ride my Volet recumbent bike, but I've also got this recumbent trike, which is a whole different kind of experience in riding. And uh, so for us, it, it turned out to be a great thing to have both. And the recumbent trike is by far the desired choice when we ride into town in Stevens Point to go to have lunch or something like that. I mean, maneuvering around in traffic and in town and crossing busy intersections and so on on a, on a trike is so nice. You're just you're sitting there clipped in ready to go and there's a gap in the traffic and you just punch it and you're across the street. And uh, so we've had a ball with them. That's, that's super. So let's uh, back to the business a little bit. So tell me a little bit about um, the impact that trikes have had now. So uh, it, it just in general uh, over the last uh, five years, say, uh, how has your business changed from uh, from selling recumbent uh, uprights to uh, up? I'm sorry, recumbent bikes to recumbent trikes? Well, of course, trikes have gotten to be vastly more popular. I mean, I I would say that. Uh, we probably sell on the order of uh, three or four recumbent trikes to every one recumbent bike. Okay. And uh, I think it's partly due to the aging of the baby boom, you know, and these people are kind of aging out of it. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things about trikes for older riders is, and we're finding that out now, we're getting to the age where we can you know, if we if we come up against a 17 or 18 percent grade, we have trouble climbing it on our bike now because we just don't have the strength and the aerobic capacity anymore to maintain four miles an hour to balance the bike. You know, climbing a hill like that. But on a recumbent trike, we can just slow way down, creep up it in low gear, and and we can we can climb hills on trikes that we never made it up on bikes, and we can do it fearlessly. <laughs> right. And, uh, and that so I has think, a great general appeal, I think, to, yeah. to like you say, the baby boomer generation, no? Yeah, it does. And and but they also, I mean, we just got back yesterday from a stroke camp uh, down in Green Lake, where um, put on by UW Hospital. And uh, what we do is we, uh, I give a talk about recumbent trikes, and uh, and then we utilize these recumbent trikes to uh, as adapt for adaptive cycling to. Equip these people with strokes, you know, stroke survivors to uh, to ride, get them back into riding again, and it's a it's a pretty awesome experience. I mean, the people you you see people smiling; they haven't smiled since they had their stroke. You know? Oh, you've you've uh, given them mobility that they that they completely oh, yeah. lost. So I mean, that's yeah, uh, we're, we're taking people. I mean, <clears throat> strokes, uh, MS. Uh, the rock war vets with missing limbs uh, and stuff like that. <clears throat> and we get people who are having a great deal of difficulty moving very far under their own power, you know, uh, unassisted. And um, and we get them on a trike and get them riding, and whereas they might have had difficulty going a block, you know, with a walk or whatever, <clears throat> they're now riding. They're now riding many miles. Right, right, and, and the the just the uh, effect that that has on their uh, on their attitudes and everything, and, and their, uh, their their overall self, health. I would think it would probably even makes an impact on their overall it's, health. It's huge. For the and, uh, yeah, yeah, and there's actually some uh, we're seeing it where people are, uh, and and Cleveland Clinic, by the way, has done some studies on this and uh, and has borne this out with some actual uh, scientific study. That uh, the process of having the, the the unaffected leg moving the affected leg around actually helps regenerate some of the neural pathways in the affected leg, and we have this. Uh, we've had quite a number of our uh, our stroke survivors that we've worked with uh, 
uh, report to us that things are starting to happen with that affected leg. You know, this one woman who had absolutely zero uh, movement anywhere in her affected leg is now starting to have a little bit of motion at the ankle on the affected leg. And her, uh, her physical therapist said that's all it's all due to the trach riding. So it's a pretty, pretty neat thing to do. That's, that's a great thing to do. So, all right, let's um, let's leave trikes. If I I, I want to uh, jump in here real quick, quickly. Uh, Gary, Gary. Yeah, yeah. Go uh, ahead. There's a there's a couple of questions that have I come was just in. gonna. Yeah, let me give me uh, just a second, Carl. I wanted. That's okay. what I wanted to do. I wanted to all encourage right. uh, those of you that are watching. Uh, we have some comments coming in. Please, uh, at this time, we're going to go on with the interview. Uh, with Rolf, but if you have questions uh, or comments, be sure to leave them, and we will bring them up here shortly. And uh, we'll take a little interlude right now, actually. And uh, Carl says he's got some. Let's take a look at some of those. Okay, here's one from uh, Rob uh, to Rolf about about a valet and a single uh, a single rider trike. If he knows anything about that. Yeah, Rolf. So the and, and the next section we're going to talk about are are your volets. So. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and start that. Then I'll go ahead and ask the general questions about the volets. Do you have any uh, any plans to come out with uh, a single rider trike volet? We don't. We don't because we feel that the uh, there are so many really good trike manufacturers out there today that we don't know what we would do to really improve on the situation. Um, so no. We don't. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for that question, Rob. I'm glad you're watching. Um, okay. Let's talk about the vole that will back up a little bit. Um, there came a point when you decided to uh, begin manufacturing your own recumbent bikes. Can you tell us the the, uh, the genesis of this? Yeah. The uh, during the process of selling recumbent bikes for for quite a while, I I saw various things that I liked on various bikes. Um, but there would be something really neat on this brand, and then there'd be something really neat over here on this brand, and something really neat on this brand. But they weren't sort of all together onto one. And uh, so I had this idea that I could combine some of those things along with some of my own ideas, incorporate some of my own ideas into uh, into a bike, you know. And that's where the volet came from. And the uh, at the time I was uh, working closely with Vision. Recumbents and Vision actually produced our volets for us at first. You know, and mm -hmm. they they shortly went out of business, not not because of hopefully producing our <laughs> well, not yeah. for us or some, for some other reasons. And um, so then we, uh, you know, I bought out all the tooling and everything and moved everything back to Wisconsin and then got in touch with, uh, with Richard Schwinn down at. Uh, Waterford Precision Cycles, the old Schwinn Paramount factory, and uh, and that turned out to be great. They were uh, they were just great to work with. You know, the uh, a lot of the a lot of the guys from the old Schwinn days are still there. You know, Mark Buller, the uh, the engineer that was there during the Schwinn Paramount days, is still there, and Roger, who was painting frames for Schwinn, is still there painting frames, and so it's it's pretty neat. And, uh, I, bet I never expected uh, some guy from Wisconsin to come to them and say, "Let's start manufacturing another kind of bike." <laughs> well, uh, they have had uh, they have had several experiences like that actually, and and one of them actually was a uh, a person who came to them and wanted them to manufacture a recumbent, but he had uh, he had wooden jigs, you know, for it, which is not not acceptable. You got to have steel jigs, you know, and uh, so they never did, but yeah, we got we got started with them, and it's been working out quite well. It's uh, tell me know. a little bit about the so you do you personally designed the vola? You said is that correct? Well, Joel helped me with it from okay. provision, you know, and uh, but now the, our current our current iteration, like our our new tandem, I completely designed that. Uh, um, the uh, well, I should take that back a little bit. Joel and I worked a little bit on it, came up with an initial plan, and then I took it from there and, and modified and changed it to the point where it's hardly recognizable as the original tandem. But um, and like our some of the things that happened in our tandem, which was to um, we, we do. I realized in the tandem that for the captain it would be really slick 
if we could have an, both an adjustable boom and a sliding seat. Uh, that gets you away from a lot of problems. I mean, you you know, you get away from all those sort of complex uh, idlers and everything to try to control the chain tension on the timing chain, and uh, and you can uh, you can fit a broad range of riders. You know, we can fit captains anywhere from about five four up to about five uh, six eight, and um, and we got uh, but. You can so you can uh, telescope the boom to kind of fit all those big guys, but then when you make, make all those new adjustments that you want to make, you don't have to be telescoping the boom and then adding or subtracting chain, you know, which is a big pain if you want to just make a minor seat adjustment. Mm -hmm. So there's enough seat adjustment to allow for that. Um, but we also wanted to uh, we also uh, Barb and I were avid tandem riders, and we. You know, she really wanted to have a good view, so we wanted to get her positioned so she could could see well, and we wanted to get rid of sort of that conflict some, that sometimes happens between the stoker's feet and knees and the captain's seat, and be able to actually have a, a seat bag on the back of the captain's seat as well as the stoker's seat and so on. So that's kind of where that all. Okay, came. so that's the volley tandem. You had the first volley. What was the first volley? Well, the first volley was the uh, back in those days. We had a we had a, a dual 650 model, mm -hmm. and a, we had a 2620 model. Okay. And uh, I can't remember way back. I don't think we did. I think I, I think way back we just had dual 650 and dual 26, and then. Uh, now it has sort of morphed into the the dual 650 models are our carbon frames, which are being made by Craig Kelphy out in California, and uh, but we also have a steel frame now, which is the uh, the Expedition series, which is a dual 26, but it's disc brakes, so it's it's gotten away, it's gotten us into a situation now because of the disc brakes sort of. You can have dual 26-inch wheels, or you can have dual 650 wheels on the same bike. So it's become kind of a jack of all trades bike. I mean, people can uh, can get two different wheel sets and have this really lightweight wheel set for doing long rides, long fast rides with their club buddies, or they can equip it with dual 26 and do touring on it and so on. Um, I feel like I'm rambling on too far on this. Okay, no, no. I just want I wanted to get the models in, and you talked about them all. And the carbon, uh, I was going to ask about that. You just mentioned that as well. So that's your that's your latest model, is that correct? Yeah, the, yeah. So, the, but what I was going to say is, and then what happened with the tandem is that when I realized that oh, we can do this uh, adjustable boom and the sliding seat combined. Uh, that I realized that we could uh, do that same thing with the single bikes and then get rid of the sizes. Because, see, we used to have four sizes. And uh, so what I've always felt is that um, to, to really fit somebody properly, you need to do more than just fit the leg length. You, know, you, you have to have more than just proper leg extension. You have to have the right four and a half weight distribution on the wheels. and uh, and we need to have the right cockpit fit. So our our new frame now is a uh, it's just a one size frame, but because of the adjustable boom and the sliding seat, we can really fit everybody on it, and I mean fit them properly. So they've got the four and a half weight distribution in the proper range, and they've got a really comfortable cockpit fit. And and there's a whole bunch of other sorts of uh, benefits that have sort of come along with it, like if a customer buys it and decides at some point in time to sell it and say he's a six foot eight guy who got an extra large frame, you know, he doesn't have to look for another six foot eight guy who's hard to find sometimes. Right. Yeah, <laughs> because can, of the uh, flexibility you have uh, tremendous. You can just detail, sell it to right? anybody. You know. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Benefits. And the other thing we used to run into is uh, uh, you know, we'd, we'd get, even with four frame sizes, we'd get people who were a little bit in between, you know, right on the edge of, between a medium and a large and stuff. Well, that's just all gone away now because you can just telescope that boom out to wherever you want it and you can have sort of a 
medium and a half if you want. Or yeah, whatever. that makes yeah. that makes really good sense. All right, I wanted to um, I wanted to address uh, some folks in our audience maybe who are not uh, experienced bent riders, uh, maybe considering it or maybe just tried it once or twice. I can't think of anyone better, Rolf, than you because I know that you have trained. Uh, rank rookies, novices, like 10,000, you know, probably 10,000 a month, I don't know, uh, how to get on a, um, a two-wheel recumbent and, and begin to ride. So I was wondering if you could uh, just take a, a couple minutes and describe for us how you train people to ride a recumbent for the first time. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, so getting people started out riding a recumbent, the big thing is to have a process, a teaching sequence that doesn't uh, doesn't frighten them, doesn't scare them off. Um, <clears throat> in way back, you know, we used to just kind of set people on the bike, have them put both feet up, and kind of push them off <laughs> and have them start riding. Well, that that's pretty scary. I mean, that's like uh, pushing somebody into the deep end and saying, "Okay, swim." You know. <clears throat> and uh, so well now by having them sit completely upright on the seat, stride along with their feet a little bit, and then just pick their feet up and uh, just a uh, few inches off the ground and just coast with their feet, their I call their outriggers ready to put down at a moment's notice, and get used to the steering and the handling of the bike and the steering geometry and so on. And, and well, what's going on during this phase is. Uh, the, the anxiety that people anticipated they were going to have, the fear is kind of dissipating because already they're on this thing and they're moving and they're not tipping over and they're, they're having some success. My goal is don't throw too many wrinkles at them at one time. Don't throw too much at them at one time. So that's why we have them sit really upright so they're used to sitting in a position that, that they would on their upright bike. Um, and then the step two, when they get used to that, is they, they do the same thing but against them. and coast again, but their feet just barely off the ground. And then step three is put your feet up and start pedaling. Now there's a few things that have to happen in preparation for this. Um, it's really important to have the uh, seat adjusted properly so that when they do put their feet up and start pedaling, their knees aren't hitting the handlebars or something like that. Um, so it takes a little bit of time to get things set up for that. But um, then the other thing I do in preparation is I tell them, okay, now when you when you do finally start riding and you're you're riding and you're not tipping over, you're going to feel like your finesse on a bicycle has gone someplace. And probably isn't coming back, you know. And uh, so just be prepared for that fact that you're going to feel that way, and that's okay. All of us have felt that way when we started. And it's going to take a while before that goes away, but that will go away. And, uh, and then I explain to them, when we get you up and get you started riding, and we, we usually do it with a Belay customer or a recumbent bike customer, we do that out in our parking lot. We actually have a dedicated test track also, but it's a little narrow for somebody who's just starting out on a bike. So we do the bike training out in our parking lot. Okay. So I have them do like 10 laps around the parking lot so that they can get comfortable with it. That sounds like a great plan, and I'm sure it's worked well for you over the years. Now, um, let's go from the very practical to a little bit more philosophical. I've got a couple of lines of questioning here as we finish up. We're beginning to run out of time. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the recumbent industry in general, and you have been working in it for uh, quite a few years. So I was wondering who it was in the uh, recumbent industry uh, over the years that you have met that uh, either you know you were impressed by, or maybe inspired you, or you had a lot of respect for. Are there uh, are there some people that uh, of of note that you've met, that you've run into in the industry that uh, uh, that are folks that you count as uh, important uh, in in your way of thinking uh, about recumbents? Sure. Yeah, definitely. The uh, um, you know the guys from Vision were 
were, were great guys and uh, and still friends of mine. And uh, the guys from Rand, you know, both Randy and John Schlitter and uh, uh, Tim Brummer from Lightning, I think, has done a lot. Of course, Gardner Martin, you know. So, um, let's see if I'm forgetting anybody. <laughs> and uh, and there's been a a, a lot of Oh, and then of course there's Ian Sims, you know, from Greenspeed as far as strikes are concerned, mm -hmm. and the guys from Ice and, and and HP and all those guys, you know, of course, and uh, and Paulo from uh, from Catrike, you know, great guy, and uh, so yeah, there's a lot of really uh, really neat people in this industry, and uh, and it's been just a pleasure to be able to meet and work with these guys, you know, so okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was interested there. Um, all right, let's talk about the uh, the health of the recumbent industry in general. I know you do uh, a great job at the hostel shop uh, at business. Uh, from all uh, accounts, are, are very good. I don't know if that carries over uh, to the industry as a whole all over the country. I hear you know from uh, various other uh, retailers, people in the business about uh, you know difficulties, especially with the um, with the uh, two wheel recumbents as opposed to the trikes. Um, can you give me your um, your take on hang, how hang you on a second, doing? Jerry? I got yeah, a yeah. little technical problem here. Okay. I, uh, <laughs> All right. I just got a message that my battery is running low and my. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I moved my chair around. I uh, oh, you knocked out the the power to your lap. Is it a laptop? To my laptop. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm back. You're back on. We didn't lose you. Back That's on. Good. Powered. Okay. So because we would yeah, have so had. I would have had to ask someone else that question. Uh, we may not have been as qualified to answer. So yeah. So the, the health of the industry, the 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 uh, the, the especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis the the two-wheeled recumbents versus the trikes. We already talked about how well trikes are doing. But in general, what what are you thinking about the recumbent industry and its future? Well, I think it's. Uh, I used to think way back when I first started, that there, that there was going to come a time where just the whole world was just going to switch to recumbents, you know. And, and I was quite surprised when I was out at one of the first CycleCon shows, the one in, in California, that there was still a lot of that kind of running around, you know, that concept running around. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Um, the, the one thing I learned early on when I was selling recumbents, I, I started selling recumbents and I thought, okay, there, which one is the best? And every time I thought I'd figured out what the best recumbent was, I swear the very next person in the door had some completely legitimate reason not to buy that bike. They were too tall, or they were too short, or, or they had some physical issue, or they, you know, I mean, there's they rode leisurely, they rode aggressively, or they rode in urban settings, or they rode in rural settings, uh, they rode on rough pavement, they rode on smooth pavement. It's 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 kind of silly to imagine that there's going to be one recumbent bike that's going to work well for all those situations. And you can take that concept and you can expand on it and you can apply that to just bikes in general. Uh, I don't really feel it's a it's situation that recumbents are better than uprights or uprights are better than recumbents. It's an upright may be better than a recumbent for this particular person in that particular application. A recumbent might be better for this person in this particular situation, this particular application. There's so many shapes and sizes of people and wants and needs and so on that uh, I, I think we need a wide variety of bikes, you know, to fit all those needs. So, um, but what I what I have found. One of our strengths is that we still sell upright bikes because people come in looking for things in an upright bike shop that tip you off that there is a problem that they're having and that they really ought to be looking at a recumbent, and but they just don't, they just don't know it yet. And uh, I don't know if I've got. I guess we're running out of time. Go but, ahead. If you have a story, I'd, I'd, li yeah. I'd like to hear the bait and switch story. Go ahead. Let me hear that. <laughs> so I had a woman come in was back in the, in the mid-90s, and, uh, and she was looking for padded underwear. And, uh, and we actually had it, but I didn't know it. 
because I was in my office too much and not out on the sales floor. And I said, well, okay, how about padded shorts? Yeah, I've got padded shorts. Oh, all right. How about a gel saddle? She said, look, I got padded shorts. I got a gel saddle. I want padded underwear. Uh, oh, man. There's an awful lot of padding going on here. This sounds like, like a, a real goal. Come on over to the other side. Slightly different. So I took her over to the other side of the store and pulled down a Rand's V-Rex. And within 24 hours, she and her husband both owned Rand's V-Rex recumbents. And she loved it. And, uh, and within a year, they had a Rand's Screamer tandem. Now, that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily doesn't happen if you're just a recumbent shop. You know, that's that's kind of the. I, I think for the health of the industry, it's really good to have people who sell upright bikes also selling recumbents, so that they can intercept those people and turn them on to recumbent. That's a great. It's a great place to uh, to prospect for recumbent customers is on the upright bike sales floor. I had never thought of it that way. I knew you sold uh, upright bikes, but I'd never thought about the uh, utility of uh, looking for an upright and, and, and changing their minds because they actually really need a recumbent. Right. So, yeah. So uh, padded underwear, I can't think of a better place to, to leave uh, this interview. Um, there's a whole lot of padding going on. I, uh, hopefully, uh, you said that. Hopefully, people won't be saying that about this show. So... Uh, <laughs> Ralph, I, I sure appreciate uh, you coming on. We really have, I had plenty more to ask. I think we're pretty much out of time, uh, which uh, leads me to think we need to do this again sometime. So I hope, uh, I hope you, you won't be averse to coming on again uh, uh, in a while, and we'll, we'll chat some more. Would that be okay? That would be great. Anytime you want the really old guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's so nice having you and, you, and your, uh, your take on things, Ralph. It's wonderful to have you. And, uh, and I guess uh, you told me earlier you're going to be at CycleCon uh, in Cincinnati in a couple we weeks. Are. Yeah. So yeah. I, will, I will see you there. Uh, Layback Bike Report. We'll have a booth uh, at CycleCon, so we hope to see everyone uh, that makes it to the Cincinnati CycleCon there. Um, let's wrap it up here. Um, uh, panel, do you have anything you wanted to add here before we wrap it up completely? I, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. Carl, you all right? All right. Well, um, the only the only thing is that's ex what Ralph was talking about. How you got into recumbents is exactly what I did. I, I was uncomfortable. I saw one. I had to have one. And ninety thousand miles later, I'm still riding it, loving it. That's that's a remarkable number there. <laughs> that's a remarkable number there, Carl. That's uh, that's great, and I think that's a I think that's a pretty typical story for many of our uh, our viewers of how they got into it. So, um, all right, um, we're going to uh, jump to the uh, Google Plus uh, community. Uh, we have uh, let's see, the last time I looked, it was 672 members, uh, grown a bit since last month. Again, thank. Thank you very much for those who are joining up on Google Plus and joining our active community talking about uh, recumbent cycling. Um, and on that community, we have uh, lots of posts. Uh, we have uh, three different uh, sections of the posts that we run a contest on, and we announce the winners on this show. We're going to do that right now. Uh, we have a picture of the month post. Uh, that was uh, won by uh, John Rosignol, and the picture was uh, about the Pelotonia on a Bichetta. Pelotonia being a big fundraiser here in central Ohio uh, for, for cancer. And uh, John has got a, quite the artistic eye and uh, put together a couple of great pictures from that. So congratulations, John. Uh, video of the month uh, was a video about the uh, disabilities ride from Berlin to Rome. Uh, this was uh, put together by our own Lars Kahn, a, a, an amazing video and an amazing uh, uh, amazing tribute to to what he did uh, for for that ride. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that, um, uh, and and congratulations to you, Lars. Thanks a lot. And the, know, Lars. <laughs> and the discussion of the month uh, was uh, a discussion about recumbents can't climb. Uh, this uh, tongue in cheek, of course. It was a video uh, about it, and uh, this was Bill Barrere 
uh, who is one of our moderators, and uh, uh, there was a lively discussion about, of course, they can. So um, you might want to take a look at that as well, a great discussion there. So uh, as always, if you join the community, please uh, put yourself on the community locator map. There's a little form to fill out, and uh, we'll get a chance to see where you are. You can see where everyone else is and maybe find some riding partners on there. Uh, that has worked out real well. We got a map full of pins. That's really nice. We could, we'd like to have some more as well. So, all right. Uh, closing out here, the uh, Layback Bike Report will, as I said before, have a, uh, a booth at the Recumbent Cycle Con, September 26th, 27th. Uh, if you are anywhere in the area or, uh, or interested enough to travel, it's it's going to be a really interesting show, I'm sure. Um, so uh, we will have some bonus webcasts uh, from the show, uh, shooting some video interviews and that sort of thing, uh, getting a take on what's going on at the show. And uh, it, it probably will not end up being a live laid-back bike report like this, uh, but we're going to put together some video and uh, post it up on the website and YouTube and we will announce that so you guys will all be able to take a look and, and catch up if you can't make it to the show and see what's going on at uh, Recom CycleCon. Um, the next Layback Bike Report will be October 11th. We will have a very special guest at that time uh, by the name of Mark Colleton. Uh, he's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the founders of Bichetta, a designer who's been around for quite a long time. And uh, we'll be interested to uh, talk to Mark and uh, find out a little bit about uh, his history and, and, and what he has done in the recumbent world. So if you'd like to uh, appear as a panelist, a guest, or know someone who would like to do so, uh, please contact me uh, at the laidbackbikereport.com. And uh, we would love to have you on. Um, I want to thank uh, my wonderful panelists, uh, uh, both uh, Carl and Lars, uh, for doing the directing and the producing. As always, a, a great look to the show from what I could see from here. Uh, thank you both very much. Thank you, Gary. Right. Just, just one and quick thing. Gary. I'd like to have a little shout out to Robert, Bob, and uh, Marco for. Uh, Posting comments on the show. So All right. Anything we, we need to the comments. Anything we need to show, or they're just kind of hellos. Well, there you go. Oh, Excellent. there we go. Let's take a quick look. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> and <laughs> do you see that, uh, Rolf? Uh, Rob is saying he still loves his 03 Volley Century. Oh, good. Cool. <laughs> and wow. anything else? Uh, well, no, that was just. Uh, okay. Oh, well, one more. This okay. is for Rolf. That uh, we hope. Uh, if Roth retires, the hostel shop continues to pro to, uh, <laughs> to stay. <laughs> I hope so too. Okay, yes, yeah, so Roth, I'm sure. All mm -hmm. right, thanks again for that, uh, Rob. All right, uh, so th thanks to the panelists and uh, my two uh, very gracious guests, uh, Julie Keating. Thank you, Julie, and uh, and thank you, uh, thank you again, Roth, for for being on the show. We'll see you next time on the Laidback Bike Report. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye-bye.